And I say this uh, uh, when I go around the state doing pastor meetings and everything else, and I mean it with all my heart, that David Barton is an American treasure. I don't know where we would be in our nation today. Amen. Amen. I really don't know where we would be if it weren't for his devotion and his hard work and his study. He has the largest private collection of original documents and artifacts from America's founding era anywhere. So even outside of the Smithsonian, he's it, okay? So guys, would you stand and put your hands together and welcome David Barton this morning? Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Wall builders, find out about us, wallbuilders.com. Based on the Bible book of Nehemiah, the concept of rebuilding things that have been torn down, religious, moral, constitutional foundations. You can find out about us there. I want to take you into what I think is happening in the country right now and what I think the challenge before us is. Um, I, I'm all over the nation right now. In the next nine days, I'll be in eight states, 14 cities, pastors' conferences, meeting the Christian leaders, etc. And the thing we're hearing all across the nation is we've got to have a revival. We see stuff going on. We know that it's not good. So we're praying for revival. And I think we've got a problem with that. Uh, national revival doesn't occur nationally. We think it does, and we keep looking for things to happen on the national level, and that's not where revivals occur. National revivals occur locally. Now, people say, well, wait a minute, you got a great awakening. That is a national revival. Well, kind of, but maybe not. George Woodfield is the guy that we point to with that national revival. George Woodfield preached 34 years. He preached 18,000 sermons. And grab this, in a day back then, with no technology anywhere close to what we have today, 80% of all Americans physically heard him preach a sermon. Now, you think Twitter and those guys wouldn't like to have 80% message penetration? You bet. How did you get 80% message penetration when there's no technology? It's real easy. He was the chaplain in the state of Georgia. He got on his horse in Georgia. He rode all the way to Maine, which was Massachusetts then. It didn't become a state until 50 years later. He rode to Maine and up in Maine, he preached from Maine to Georgia. Now, every town he went through, he stopped and preached in every town he went through. When he got to Maine, he turned around and rode back to Georgia. He took a different route. He stopped in every town he went through coming back. When he got to Georgia, he turned around and went back to Maine, took a different route, preached in every town he went through. He made seven trips from Georgia to Maine to Georgia, 34 years. The reason 80% of all Americans physically heard him preach a sermon was because he was in 80% of the towns of America having revivals in 80% of the towns. Revival would break out in local towns and local minister would keep it going for years longer. When he was in Western Virginia, the Reverend Samuel Davies kept the revival going another 19 years. When he was in Boston, it was Samuel Cooper that kept it going another 10 years. When he was in Philadelphia, it was Gilbert Tennant who kept it going another 12 years. Revivals broke out in all these local areas. We call it a national revival because it affected so much of America, but it wasn't a national revival. It was local revivals that spread across the nation. And when you look at local revivals, how they spread across the nation, the same thing occurs with the birth of the nation. When you go back to our American Revolution, our War for Independence, you take the first four battles in the American War for Independence. Uh, top right, you have Lexington, top left, a bridge at Concord. Bottom left is Road to Boston. Uh, bottom right is Bunker Hill. It's interesting, those first four battles that began independence, nobody contacted George and said, George, you're the national commander in chief. We are really outnumbered here. We got to have your help in a hurry. Nobody contacted George because the whole mindset was, it's our community, George, we'll take care of it. You got important things to do, we'll take care of our community. And that's the way the American War for Independence went. Most folks don't have a clue that in the American War for Independence, there were more than 120 battles. Can you name 120 battles? No, we can name four or five. That's all we learn about. See, most of the battles you would never even recognize. You look at the titles on those battles, we don't recognize those. And see, the American War for Independence was a whole bunch of local battles, and we won so many of those local battles that we won the national battle, but we won the national battle by winning the local battles. It's just like revival. So we're looking for change in the nation. We're looking for revival in the nation. We want political change in the nation. We want change at the White House. We want change at Congress. We want all this change. Great. You're looking at the wrong place. Look at a different place. Look at locally because that's where change occurs is locally. When you look at this from a political standpoint, you look at it in the sense of, of voting. We have an obsession with the national focus. You know, Richard, you guys are going to be a little more informed. But if I ask most group, I say, who's the president of the United States? I'm going to get an answer and most people get it. If I say, who's the president of your local school board? Maybe one or two percent. If I say, 
who name three federal lawmakers give me three federal law you can do that if i say name three of your city's lawmakers your city council members we're we're down to nearly nothing we're much more informed on what happens nationally and we can do much less to change what happens nationally than what we can do to change locally. So our obsession with the national focus really has to be turned back locally. It's because of what we have with media and technology now that we think in big grandiose terms, it comes back to, as the Great Commission says, Jerusalem, right where you live, then Judea, then Samaria, then the uttermost parts of the earth. We keep doing the uttermost parts of the earth. We gotta do the Jerusalem part right where we live. So when you look at where we are politically, voting is, is really a simple thing but I want to take it to the local level because at the local level only about 6% of Americans vote at a local level and by the way that's 6% of registered voters only 65.3% of American adults are registered voters so we have roughly 100 million American adults who can vote but who don't vote because they won't register we've got roughly 40 million evangelicals who can vote but they don't vote because they won't register you imagine how different America would be if 40 million evangelicals were to actually participate, the ones that don't participate right now. So what happens is when you look at a local, 6% of 65.3% or 6% of registered voters, usually local turnout has about 4%. It takes half of that to win, which is 2%. Let me give you examples of how that plays out in real life. If you take a city like Los Angeles, Los Angeles is the second largest city in the United States. Los Angeles population is so large that the population of Los Angeles is larger than the population of 23 separate individual states. So if you're Eric Garcetti, who is the mayor of Los Angeles, that's like being a governor in 23 different states. Eric Garcetti, who is very hostile to faith, he closed the churches down, left everything else open, but we definitely gotta get those churches shut. He, he brags that he was elected with 2.9% of the vote. Really? It's like a governor, two point, yeah, we don't pay attention to local stuff and he has a huge impact on what happens there, whether it be on, on the way they handle crime or the way they handle anything else. Let me take you to another city. Fort Worth is, is very close to where I live. I was raised right around Fort Worth. I'm a cowboy from Texas. And six and a half years ago, the Fort Worth Independent School District said, hey, you know, we've been looking at it and we've looked at this gender thing and we just think that we're not going to do this gender stuff anymore in schools. Uh, we're we're, we're going to let kids choose whatever restroom they want. They can choose whatever locker room they want. They can choose whatever shower room they want. We're just not going to do genders in school anymore. This is Fort Worth, Texas, cowboy town. Interestingly, at that time, President Obama was in office and his Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, said, that's a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? Here's the new national policy. He said, if your school gets federal funds, which is more than 97% of the schools in America, we're not going to do gender stuff in school anymore. We're, we're not going to have gender identification. You just, whatever you want. And so it changes this point. Now, this is really frustrating for people like me because if you know anything about Fort Worth, Texas, its nickname is called Cowtown, USA. Literally twice a day in Fort Worth at 11 in the morning, at 11.30 in the morning, at four o'clock in the afternoon, we shut down North Main Street and have a cattle drive up and down Main Street. We take these longhorns up and down Main Street. Now, it's interesting, Fort Worth, I, you know, I, I told you I'm a cowboy from Texas. You may not be a cowboy. You may not even like the cowboy life at all. It doesn't matter. I can stick any of you behind that herd of cattle and all of you can tell me the gender of every <laughs> critter in that cow. It, it's really not a difficult thing to do. And so for Fort Worth, Texas to come up with, we don't know what genders are and we don't, it, 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 it's craziness. So I looked in Fort Worth and Fort Worth has 918,000 voters. That's the 13th largest city in the United States. And the president of the school board who came up with this silly policy was elected with less than 1,200 votes. 1,182 votes is what he elected with. So I went and looked in the district where he, uh, where he was elected from and I instantly found dozens of evangelical churches in that district. As a matter of fact, I found one church that by itself had 3,000 registered evangelical voters. That one church could have prevented that guy from being on the school board, which would have saved the entire nation from six and a half years of gender nonsense that we've been having over that period of time. It went back to a local election that didn't get solved. Local stuff becomes national stuff. If you want to fix the national, you fix the local. And Fort Worth is a good example of that. 